Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Tales, a podcast from Afar Media. I'm your host, Senior Editor Aislinn Green, and for the past six years, I've had the pleasure of working with some of the most creative and interesting people in the world. Comedians, philosophers, novelists, they've all shared their stories with Afar's readers about getting out into the world and just reveling in it. And now, each week on Travel Tales, we'll hear from some of our favorite contributors about a trip that changed their life. And because the world is really anything but normal right now, thanks to COVID-19, I'm recording all of this from my houseboat in California. In this episode, we meet Nagin Farsad. Nagin is a comedian, host of the podcast Fake the Nation, and author of How to Make White People Laugh. She's also a diehard New Yorker. And so we figured, why not send her to Kansas City, Missouri? It was part of Afar's Spin the Globe series in which we send a writer someplace with only 24 hours notice and they just have to figure it out. So let's listen in and find out what happens as Nagin human Googles her way through America's city of fountains. Soon it will be time for another adventure. But for now, enjoy these stories from travelers who have connected to our world on a deeper level and let them fuel your dreams of a future adventure. And with the Marriott Bonvoy Boundless Card, you'll be well on your way to powerful new experiences. Learn more at MarriottBoundlessCard.com. So I'm in Kansas City, which is both in Missouri and in Kansas. Of course, I assume that being in two states would give Kansas City a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde vibe, but more on that later, because at this point, I'm actually at The Improv, a comedy club on the east side of town, and I'm about to go on stage and do stand-up. The lights are low, and the audience is taking their two-drink minimum so seriously it's turning into a four-drink minimum. It's the last night of my trip to Kansas City, and I'm either going to end it on a bang or a self-hating whimper, depending on whether the audience hates me or thinks I'm hilarious. In comedy, there really is no in-between. Even though I'm in Kansas City as a traveler, I made sure I could do a spot at a comedy club at least once. You probably don't know this about comedians, but as a comic, I look at every city I travel to with dirty, hungry comedy eyes. I'm always asking, could I get up and do a set in this city? I'm like a drug addict. If I could just do 10 minutes in this random town, I'll feel better. I'll know what this place is about. I'll get closer to having laughter fill the unfillable void left by my parents who never complimented me as a child. By the way, if you withhold love from your children, you turn them into comedians, and then their career choices are your fault. I'm waiting in the wings, incessantly checking my nose for any hangers, because that's what I do before I go on stage. People probably think I have an itchy cocaine nose, which is funny because I'm more of a beet juice user. Plus, I'm feeling a little weird because the driver of the lift ride I took to the club spent 15 minutes trying to convince me that all the women who accused Bill Cosby of rape, all 60 of them, were lying. That they had conspired to all lie together, across state lines and across decades. That put me in a mood. So here I am about to go on stage, and while my nose is clear, I'm a little worried about how this is going to turn out because comedy is an overwhelmingly male sport. It's also overwhelmingly white. And I'm an Iranian-American Muslim, like all of you. And the last time this club, which operates every night of the week, had seen a woman was five weeks ago. But I figure I'm just going to open with some universal stuff about being pregnant because, oh yeah, this whole time I'm in Kansas City, I'm six months pregnant. Pregnant and traveling alone. So I'm an Iranian-American Muslim who's pregnant and alone, and I'm standing out even more because I'm walking everywhere, or rather, waddling everywhere. That's the best way to really see a place. But like most places in the country, walking in Kansas City makes people look at you like you're some kind of lunatic wearing a soft helmet. But if I hadn't walked, I would have missed the adorable Yum Bakery and its signature sweet potato donut. I mean, I try not to do carbs, but when you're pregnant in Kansas City, you should do carbs. I would have missed this beautiful walkway along Brush Creek that's so close to the water you could reach over and touch it. And maybe it's contaminated, but that's what makes it an exciting urban landscape. But I really felt at ease in the Power and Lights District, which is like their nighttime at-the-club neighborhood. 
because occasionally a waft of human urine would greet my nostrils. And as a New Yorker, that made me feel at home. And it turns out, being pregnant is a great entree to talk to strangers. I went to the Green Lady Lounge to watch some jazz and have a mocktail, even though if I were in Europe, I would have had a full cocktail because apparently alcohol doesn't affect European pregnant women, only American pregnant women. Anywho, while I was there, I struck up conversations left and right because no one suspects a pregnant woman of being evil or having an agenda. They assume you're a nice person. I wanted to tell them, hey, be careful talking to me because I could be evil and pregnant at the same time. Don't be fooled by the belly. My soul could still be filled with dark sludge. But I didn't say any of that because I'm not that evil. Of course, an evil person would say that, so I'm probably fully evil. So when I was at the Green Lady Lounge, I found out that Kansas City is actually one of the birthplaces of jazz. I had no idea. I always assumed it was New York. But Charlie Parker, that dude was from Kansas City. And I don't actually know about jazz, and I know that he's a big deal. I also learned that whole neighborhood had transformed. Like the downtown area used to be a couple of wig shops, strip clubs, and an inexplicable fur coat store. But now there is all this stuff. Live music, and cafes, and a streetcar. Far Travel Tales, presented by the Marriott Bonvoy Boundless Card from Chase, is a powerful way to connect through stories of travel. Stories move us. They take us across the world and into the unknown. Stories inspire us to ask questions and dream of possibilities. The experiences we share give us a glimpse of where we could go, what we could learn, how we could grow. We hope the stories here will lift you up and give you inspiration for adventures to come. Until then, the Marriott Bonvoy Boundless Card can help you on your way to future destinations. Learn more at MarriottBoundlessCard.com. I digress. I'm on stage at the improv. The opening comic is closing on a bit about big chested women and their huge bras. I mean, <laughs> Isn't that hilarious, guys? How women who have big boobs have to wear huge bras? <laughs> the audience is loving the huge bra material, so at this point, I'm fairly certain that they're going to hate me. I'm on stage, and I open with a bit about ultrasounds. Because for me, sometimes I would look at an ultrasound and I would be like, okay, that looks like a baby. Other times I was like, that looks like night vision footage from a drone attack in Afghanistan. Is the Taliban inside of me? (laughs) Because we really did lose track of this war. They laughed. That material was safe. My set kind of paralleled my experience in the city. When you're a traveler, you always start with the safe stuff. In KC, you start with the Plaza District. Oh my, it's so beautiful and well landscaped. Or they call this the city of fountains and boy, do you guys have a lot of fountains. Or the barbecue here is delicious, but it got all over my face. (laughs) That's the easy stuff. But in comedy, once you're done with the pleasantries, you move into the more difficult material. Here, that meant my complicated background. Because when you hear Iranian-American, you immediately think, she could be enriching uranium. Which I was, in the green room. Then I start talking about my husband, because I had also recently gotten married. We don't need to worry about the order in which the pregnancy and the marriage happened. I'm not wearing my wedding ring. I almost never wear my wedding ring because it gets in the way of me banging other dudes. But my husband is black, making my baby black and Iranian, or a Blaranian. She will be stopped at all of the borders. When things with my then boyfriend got serious, I had to tell my parents. They're immigrants who are a touch, like a fun amount racist. When I told them I was getting serious with a black man, my mom was like, we obviously do not hate black people, but why are you dating black people that we obviously do not hate? So there it was. Me talking about race to a Kansas City audience. It was clearly a touchy territory, The traveler equivalent is when I went to a Nick Cave exhibit on the east side of town. 
That's the side of town that everyone said not to go to. Cave had taken over an abandoned church in a historically black neighborhood. The church had no pews, no altars, no religious tchotchkes. Just a large open space with flying buttresses and that haunting feeling that this place was once bumpin'. That it used to be the anchor of this neighborhood until it wasn't. That at some point people wore their Sunday best, listened to the words of a preacher, and checked each other out. They gossiped, they kvetched, they praised, they observed, they held in farts. And now the world-famous Nick Cave, another Kansas City native, would fill it with art because the people had literally abandoned it. And when I was there, I saw streams of Kansans and Missourians coming through the church in the wrong side of town, making themselves uncomfortable in a neighborhood that they tell pregnant lady tourists not to go to. And that felt pretty hopeful. And it really is, because it's all about this cross-pollination. Because once my parents met my black boyfriend, they loved him. They had their own texting relationship. They exchanged recipes. He's like the son they never had, except for they do have a son. My mom went from being like, why black people, to black lives matter. She's an officially woke immigrant lady. And the audience laughed. But some laughed uncomfortably. It's like they didn't realize they were going to be on the other side of town with my comedy, but here they were. This is how Kansas City proved itself to be a real city. Because like most real cities in America, it still hasn't figured out its segregation problem. Like all of America, it hasn't figured out its inequality problem, but it really wants to. So I get the light, and I have to close with something, and I figured I already brought the wrong side of town with my stand-up. Let's lean in by pointing out that my husband is black and I'm Muslim, and our relationship is exactly what you think it is. He waterboards me every night to get the coordinates of my sleeper cell. I like to stop and frisk him for no reason. He comes home and he's like, woman, where's my watermelon? And I'm like, we don't have watermelon, only saffron. And that's literally what our relationship is like, according to Mike Pence. I weathered the difficult material and left the club. I had weathered my excursion to the east side of Kansas City, too. As I strolled through the half-abandoned neighborhood towards the fancier side of town, I walked by a huge community party. A bunch of families had taken over a park. They had pumped up the jams and were dancing with pure joy. I didn't join in because everyone should be spared a pregnant woman dancing. But to watch them, it seemed like for one brief moment, there was no east or west side of town. It was all united by the most sincere of summertime booty shaking to create one Kansas City. That was Nagin Farsad. Nagin is back home in New York with her young daughter. She says she's waiting for life to return to normal with a big fat question mark. She hasn't done stand-up in more than three months. Instead, she's distracting her dirty, hungry comedy eyes with really embarrassing workout dance classes. It doesn't fill the void, but it does something, she told us. Ready for more travel stories? Visit us online at afar.com slash travel tales. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We're at Afar Media. If you enjoyed today's adventure, we hope you'll come back next week for more great stories. Subscribing makes this easy. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. And please be sure to rate and review us. It helps other travelers find the show. This has been Travel Tales a production of Afar Media and Boom Integrated. Our podcast was produced by Aislinn Green, Adrian Glover, and Robin Lai. Post-production was by John Marshall Media staff Jen Grossman and Clint Rhodes. Music composition by Alan Koresha. And a special thanks to Laura Redman, Sarah Storm, and Irene Wang. I'm Aislinn Green, your zoomed-out, under-traveled host. I can't wait to hit the road again. Until we all freely can, remember that travel begins the moment we walk out our front door. 
Everyone has a travel tale. What's yours? 